afternoon and welcome. My name is Gary Cook and I have the honor to serve on the Board of Directors for both of the organizations that are the host of today's event. The Arlington Real Estate Group and the Commercial Real Estate Brokers Association. Today we have an all-star lineup that is going to share with us their insight into the most exciting deal that has come to Arlington in years, Nestle USA. Additionally, we have gathered our state and local economic development leaders to share with us not just how they help win Nestle, but how they can help win your tenant, hopefully into my space next time. Sorry, Tim. So without further ado, we have Christina Wynn, the Director of Arlington Economic Development Business Investment Group, to share with us some of the latest information on Arlington's business incentive programs. Well, hello. Um, as Gary said, I lead the business investment group for Arlington Economic Development, which means that we have about a team of 10 that works with new businesses as well as our existing businesses to help recruit um, companies to Arlington as well as keep them happy when, when they do finally locate. I've been asked to give you a, a real quick overview on incentives and um, put some context around what you're going to hear from the, our panelists later. So I want to really, I'm going to hit touch on three different points. You know, first is, you know, um, why we do incentives in the first place, what is really that criteria uh, if you have a company or if you are a company and you're interested in incentives, as well as just to go very briefly, depending on time, go over some of the key programs and the key highlights. So the first thing in terms of context is since January of 2015 when our fearless director took over at Arlington Economic Development, we've worked on about, with about 120 25 companies um, and assisted them in some way. We have only incentivized 7% of those. So, um, you know, we don't do it a lot um, and we do it strategically. And of that, you know, even though you may read in the papers that, you know, millions have been offered, at this point in time, we've only paid out just over $500,000. Because the most important thing that I want you to walk away from today is that for Arlington County, all of our incentive programs are performance based. It means that companies have to perform before they get paid. We don't pay before you perform. Um, so that's a, that's a real key point. And, you know, so just to give you a little bit of history on how we even got there is I saw Susan Liberty. So Susan Liberty had the um, pleasure of actually doing our first real incentive deal. If, I'm going to take you back in time to a couple years ago when you know our vacancy was rate was at its all-time high of 21%, um, and it was you know on a trend upwards. And we knew we had to do something. Uh, Susan walked in the door with Lidl and said, "Hey, this one is yours to lose." But we're competing against Charlotte, North Carolina. You know what can you do? At that point, our county had never did a cash incentive, never. Um, we had always matched the state's programs with uh, an infrastructure match. So we got creative, you know, thought out of the box, and really helped, um, you know, attract Lidl. And that was really the first step of getting our leadership and our board to, to realize that incentives do make a difference. And since then, you know, we've done Grant Thornton. We did, um, we made an offer to O-Power. Um, however, many of you may not know, O-Power never actually collected on those incentives because they were bought by Oracle. And as I said before, they were performance-based. And so when that happened, um, they actually laid off some people, and so those incentives were not, um, they didn't qualify for them anymore. Uh, we did, um, um, uh, I just lost my track, sorry. Um, Grant Thornton, Nestle, obviously what you'll hear about more. Um, and then we've done a few deals by ourselves without the state's cooperation, which are um, two 1776 and Eastern Foundry, which were our catalyst to do um, really feeding our tech ecosystem, as well as um, a, a large nonprofit user. So 
what you want to know is what do I need to, to be able to um, do to be able to qualify for incentives. There's really five key things that both the state and the county look for. New jobs. In most cases, you have to have at least 50 new employees growing over a three-year period. When we look at incentives, we look at three-year periods. What are those salaries that you're paying um, in terms of average? So in Arlington, the prevailing average wage is $86,000 right now. So if the new, those 50 new jobs are making over, um, paying salaries over $86,000, you're going to then qualify. How much square footage are you taking down and how long is that lease term? And then for the state, a really major thing for them is what's that capital investment? So how much are you putting into the tenant improvements, the furniture and the fixtures. Um, for some of the programs, it, you have to reach a, a $5 million capital investment over that three-year period. So let's say that you have a company and they qualify. Well, what you next thing you need to know is, as I said, for, especially for Arlington County, is that they are performance-based. So there is a large uh, a legal agreement that goes into place after the incentives that spells out how much the company is going to um, achieve over that three-year period in terms of jobs and square footage and salaries. And if they don't achieve those things, so for Arlington County, you wouldn't get paid. Um, in the state's case, that at the end of that period, if something happens, dramatically happens to that company, if they get bought or, you know, terrible situation where they have to lay off people, then there's clawbacks in place. So you need to understand that. Um, so we're not just, um, you know, giving that money out, we're using it strategically. And um, the next piece I really want to just touch on real briefly is um, why we do incentives. And that is because from, if you remember, you know, we were a government place. We had that high vacancy. And people weren't looking, companies weren't looking at us. And we felt that by strategically using incentives to get us in the game, that people would actually then take a look. The other point is, is that we're not here to, um, fill a real estate transaction gap. So if you have a deal and you know the, the, the deal mechanics of the actual real estate are not working out, Arlington or the state are not gonna come in and try to make that real estate work. We're there to actually help close the deal. So assuming everything is equal between your two locations, we're hoping that the incentives actually um, move the needle in Arlington's direction. So we really want to help close that deal, and that's how we use incentives. Um, so real quick, because I'm running out of time, you have a, this wonderful matrix handout. Um, on one side is the Virginia Economic Development Partnership Programs, and you'll hear a little bit from Rob later on. And then the other side is the Arlington County incentives. So if we put them in two buckets, um, the if you look at the Virginia side, the Small Business and uh, Virginia Job Investment Program, as well as the Small uh, Business Loans Grant Fund, and on the other side on Arlington, the Technology Zone, those are probably, those are to the, the right of the matrix, those are the most popular programs and most easiest for uh, companies to qualify. They have the least administrative work and, um, you know, they're very flexible. On the right side of both sides of matrix, the matrix, you have the discretionary. These are the cash grants that you hear most about in the newspaper. The Commonwealth Opportunity Fund from the state um, has very large requirements in terms of 50 new jobs, um, you know, sal average high salaries, and at least $5 million capital investment. We use that to match with uh, the Arlington County's IDA grants. 
And then the, the green column in the Virginia side is the Virginia Economic Development Incentive Grant. And that program is probably the hardest to achieve because it takes um, at least the creation of 400 new jobs that are paying at least one and a half times the average prevailing wage, which is 120,000, or 400 new jobs, which um, is uh, at two times. So at uh, 160,000. So this is a lot of information, and um, but we tried to simplify it for you to help you and guide you. I wanted to point out there. I have several of my team members here: Alex Taylor, Katie, Cindy Ye. If you could stand up for a second, real quick. Where are you guys? Okay, these people and myself are available afterwards to ask any questions and we can give you some details. Um, as well as we're more than happy to come out to your uh, offices and make presentations. But I just wanna end it with that and I think you'll get a lot more details but I just wanted to try to give you some context. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite our panel up. This is a fireside chat. So with us this afternoon, we have the key players of the Nestle USA deal. We have Dawn Strip, Strip, Strip uh, head of real estate, co corporate real estate for Nestle USA, and then two gentlemen who uh, need no introduction, Tim Helmick, managing partner of Monday Properties, and Lou Christopher, vice chairman of CBRE. Thank you all very much for joining us this, uh, this afternoon. As you all know, the Nestle USA headquarter relocation is the hottest news to hit DC real estate in years. Um, and with that, I will jump right into um, actually the first question, um, which goes to Dawn. Nestle USA announced their intention to relocate to 1812 North Moore in Roslyn on February 1st of this year. Can you tell us when the decision was made to explore relocating your corporate headquarters from California, and what were your three top objectives? Okay. So we actually started this process back in 2013. So at that point, it was more of an internal process to try to get our internal management behind this idea of a move. We partnered with Deloitte at that time. We did a lot of relocation searches on lots of different areas. And internally, it was more about getting management aligned and getting the business case together. Because for us, this is much bigger than a real estate move. This is a business transformation. And Nestle is really looking at trying to do business differently. Um, and so we had to put together this larger business case. And you know, we were talking earlier um, you know, with the Deloitte partners is that we've, I've been in this position for over 10 years. And we've done some sort of reload look probably every single year, if not every other year, for 10 years. And, you know, so we never really know what's going to happen. But this project became pretty real about December of 2015 when we started in earnest doing market searches with CBRE. Um, our initial search was limited to um, other areas outside of the Arlington um, area for Virginia because we were looking for a standalone building. Our executives really wanted a standalone Nestle kind of feeling. And you know, we kind of went down a path for a while until almost October of 2016 when we lost a building that we thought was going to be our new headquarters. So we actually probably came for the first time to this building, probably in October, November time frame and you know, made a decision pretty quickly. So by December, we made a decision and then got the lease negotiation together pretty quickly for that February announcement. So pretty quick once we got our management aligned behind us. Well, I would say pretty quick, just thinking you know, 13 months for a 200,000 square foot deal is lightning speed even if you're just moving across the street. Um, if you're moving across the country, I mean, that God love you. Um, <laughs> uh, can you and, and Lou, you know, I guess this is really to Lou too, 
tell us the chronological process, how you went through that, because we hear, or Lou told us, uh, or led us to believe through, through rumors. You know, we're, we're, a rumor, <laughs> we're, a rumor, we're a rumor mill in here. Yeah, we um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, there were other, there were other markets, but uh, can you tell us the chronological process for the city selection and then ultimately the site selection? Well, first, I've never been worried about my socks before. My wife always tells me not to wear torn <laughs> socks. And I was like, are these the socks she tells me I should throw away? But I guess I'll pull that down in case they are. Um, we, uh, you know, following Dawn's and the executive team's um, really instruction, we looked at standalone buildings. And so the process was to look at standalone buildings in Reston, Herndon, Tyson's, Merrifield. We looked at a couple with you, Gary, and Crystal, and we covered the market. And maybe, you know, I think for confidentiality reasons, we, we, we originally said we were looking for 30,000 square feet because 30,000 square feet doesn't make people look up. And, and, but the buildings, we knew what we needed and how soon could other tenants get out, and so on paper we eliminated things. I think we maybe had, in the whole process, five tours. And more and more we start hearing from Nestle that the key, this wasn't a real estate decision, it was a labor decision, and that the, the, the attracting the millennial workforce was what they really wanted to achieve. And we continue to say, you've got to look in Roslyn, you've got to look at this one asset. It's a trophy building. It's in the midst of the millennials that live in D.C. and live in Clarendon. And it's been vacant for three years. We can do a good deal. It's got great sponsorship. Um, and so we looked here. Yeah, and Tim did a great sell job to our executives. He had this whole concept. It's a building within a building. You know, so you do have your own standalone building. And I think that they were able to help us to see how Nestle could have a presence in a building that is a large, uh, you know, urban setting. So by, you know, letting us go into the lobby and creating a presence in the lobby that feels very Nestle, and then having most of the upper stack, you know, we really are creating kind of that feel we wanted, even being part of a multi-tenant building. So again, they have the top stack of the building. With the county's help, the bus stops out front are getting moved so that Nestle's interest will, entrance will be very visible and there won't be interference out there. We, they have their own dedicated parking area. They have some executive shuttles directly to the top from the parking area. Lots of nuances um, came together because Tim worked really hard at it. And that kind of that kind of comes to uh, to the, the the pointed question to Tim because you know you really remained vigilant over the past few years uh, that eighteen twelve was going to reinvent the Roslyn market uh, and hats off to you uh, to bring a new tenant that would not come here otherwise. Can you explain your thinking and how you were able to stay so strong on your convictions? Wow, wasn't wasn't. Uh... That, that was a difficult three years. Let's just put it bluntly. So, um, you know, as you, you know, with, you know, as we were leading up the decision to to go forward with the building, you know, all the data and all the mar all the metrics pointed toward it being a, you know, a thoughtful decision. Our original thesis was. Let's build upon what the Roslyn sector plan and its blueprint created and what, you know, our neighboring developers had, you know, built off of that momentum. And let's, let's focus on the core of Roslyn, deliver a world-class trophy product in a market where it was supply constrained more broadly. We had job growth going on. And, um, you know, everything was going, you know, our way, and then obviously the the one-two punch of BRAC and then sequestration, and you know there we were left for you know one year, then two years, and then third year came along, and then wow, it felt uh, it felt tempting to do a twenty or a forty thousand square foot lease, and you know our partners were were also very patient, fortunately. But you know, at the end of the day, we felt that if we were to do that, we would just, in essence, commoditize the building. And then we would be competing with all of the other vacant product that's either reinvented itself or it, too, had some shadow space. 
And we stayed true to our belief that if we were to build a world-class building in, what, in a marketplace, we felt was unmatched as far as accessibility, access to your know, transportation, this great multimodal transit hub, and then access to lifestyle and, and a growing environment. And as Central Place was delivering, and the focus of that original thesis of the Roslyn Sector Plan and, and really focusing on the core of Roslyn, it made, um, it made us you know, grow in our commitment over time. And that, that's really, we held true to those beliefs. As Central Place delivered, I think everything really started to come together. So we're, we're really thankful that that happened. Uh, because as, as people started to see those buildings come up and see that you know, the county really was thoughtful and how we separated those two buildings and having the view corridors preserved and then you know, as the Vornado project got approved, we were able to really prove to Dawn and leadership that you know, the views aren't going to be totally obstructed. There are thoughtful view corridors that will remain. And so it, it, it really was, uh, it was a tough three years, though, I will say. <laughs> well, let's forget those three years real quick because Dawn just brought up, you know, did you say December that you came? Okay. Wow. Um, that's eight weeks. So when you guys really seriously engaged, you're talking about eight weeks. You got Christmas in there, too. Hey, describe those eight weeks. All three of you. I guess I go, <laughs> let's go the middle. Tim. Well, Lou is uh, a tough negotiator. Um, there was a lunch that he and I had, and it was a pretty poignant question. Are you... Are you guys of the mindset to finally do a deal? And I, you know, certainly I pivoted back. Well, if it's a 1,500 square foot tenant, I don't think we are. But, uh, but certainly, you know, he just left it at that and left me hanging at that lunch <laughs> for about four weeks. And then four weeks later, uh, I get a call and he says, "Be ready by tomorrow morning." Of course, this is, you know, 11 hours before the tour. Get all your collateral. Um, don't tell a single soul. And so that's what started. And, you know, we really, in that first tour, in meeting Dawn and, and the broader team, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, there was a great sense of an understanding of what their objectives were in that first meeting, which allowed us to kind of pivot our marketing materials and understand the overall strategy that Nestle had, which led us to, um, you know, really creating this building in a building concept and, um, and certainly keeping Interface Multimedia very busy for, you know, the better part of six to eight weeks with videos. And, and, um, and so it, it, it led to a toward pace toward getting this deal done. And I'll let Lou. Yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, I think really the point that Dawn was referring to was really when we got to where we made, well, when they made the decision after they came here, the top executives and then flew back and called, you know, that next day wondering what the decision was going to be. You know, we had at the, at the options, the short, the three shortlisted options, we had 25 to 45 page RFPs. So when we went to lease, you know, we had a 40 page RFP here. You take all the risk mitigation issues out because it's just not new construction. It was existing, which we all know are the hardest parts of lease documents when it's new construction, all the related issues. And so um, Dawn had excellent counsel in California. We flew out there for two or three days. We locked in. We had breakfast, dinner together. And, you know, you had a seller who was very motivated and you had a buyer that, you know, wanted what they get as a big Fortune 100 company, but also wanted to make it happen. That's, that's awesome. Um, so what do you, th this is again to, uh, to Tim, uh, what do you think the Nestle deal does for Roslyn? And obviously, there's the, the obvious impact on the occupancy, but what do you think the other ripple effects are? Well, I think in large part, certainly there's, there's validation, right? The, the last major corporate relocation that I think redefined the skyline was Gannett and USA Today back in the early 80s. Um, 
and to have you know the validation of Nestle, which is a worldwide brand which values everything with excellence, um, put a seal of approval on on Roslyn, and you know obviously 1812 is is you know met their objectives. But I think this for Arlington and Roslyn itself, it was your know, great validation of smart planning, your know, incredible bid staff, which has you know redefined you know, the day-to-day -day life and, and put forth a strategic vision that, that is obtainable and tangible um, and opening up the broader market to understanding the benefits that Roslyn really has. I mean, we are a 10-minute either walk, train ride, or drive from everything. Um, and what market has the access to the Potomac River where you can go and just grab a paddleboard during lunch and come back? The access to walkable trails and running trails and and then you layer on top of it all the programming activities that are happening out at Central Place Park or Dark Star Park or Gateway Park. You know, those amenity lifestyle attributes are something that I don't think a lot of people are familiar with with Roslyn. So when folks see the Nestle transaction, I think that some of those intangibles really come to the fore and you know we love selling that and for some it's a little bit bit of a you know repetitive but to see Nestle really endorse that um, we're just we're thrilled the momentum has been fantastic um, certainly the pace of tours has been amped up if a certain company was looking out west and said well what made Nestle pivot back in town you know, there's certainly a curiosity and wanting to understand why. And if there's tenants that are, you know, DC centric, well, maybe we should look at Roslyn because of its accessibility, price, competitiveness, access to talent, uh, and lifestyle. So I think all those intangibles that we've been selling year over year, um, certainly the Nestle transaction validated much of that, and we're we're thrilled with it. That kind of leads to, you know, you, you brought up again the Reston thing, and, and, and Dawn, in, in the beginning, you, you said that your original uh, thought was a standalone building in Reston. How, um, how did it go from there to here? here? I mean, you know, they uh, we were joking before that millennials kept coming up. and Every day. Uh, you know, how big of a deal was the activation, the, the metro, all of those things? Tell us, tell us where that... That came into play. Yeah, I think honestly, when we kind of did the second pass of um, market tours, you know, I saw this building the first time, and we just weren't that excited about it. It just this huge multi-tenant building, and we were kind of like, eh, that's not really the feel we wanted. But then we, you know, I think they took me out to 25 places in one day um, <laughs> when we came back, and after the October when we lost the one building, and there was just nothing. You know, there was nothing I could really get that excited about. A lot of the standalone buildings were kind of more in corporate parks and didn't feel very vibrant for what Nestle was looking for. We did want that urban corridor. We wanted more of that liveliness. Um, and we felt that in Reston, there was a little pocket where you could get it, but there wasn't a lot of places you could get it. Um, and then, you know, being a Southern California company and coming here and really understanding what this place has to offer, I think really appealed to all of us that were part of that decision-making process. But in all honesty, I mean, the millennial thing was day in and day out. We had maps of where they live and how far it would be for them to get to this place versus the other place. And so that was really key. And one of the, one of the things that you mentioned the other day that I thought was really cool is, uh, uh, the markets that you did look at originally and, and, and drill it down to, uh, access to international flights was a big deal. Yeah. yeah, we really looked at, you know, between Dulles and DCA, how quickly could we get our executives back and forth to Switzerland, which we do a lot. Our Swiss executives come out here a lot. And when we were looking at the broader cities, um, that was a big play. I mean, that's why, you know, the Georgia area became one of our other real big competitors because of that airport. Um, okay, so uh, kind of to, to wrap things up, because I know we want to want to turn it over to the uh, to the others. Um, when uh, when you think of the process and the outcome, what and we'll start down at the end. Uh, what comes to mind? Sum up the first things that you think of when you uh, when you think of the the entire process and how it how it wrapped up. Did you give me that question before? Yeah. 
<laughs> Obviously, you I didn't mean, read like, it. <laughs> look, as a, as a Washingtonian and someone who's desperate for a great sports team and someone who's very, very sad today, <laughs> after I gave up my love of the Redskins for the love of the Capitals, and now I don't know who to love, look, it's an unbelievable win for this region. I mean, this is an international company. The decision makers who came out are from London, from Latin America. I mean, very smart people who know the world. And they looked at this market and the opportunity here and said, that's where we should put one of the best brands in the world. I mean, it was a big victory for this region. Maybe the Swiss hockey players will want to start coming over here. Maybe. <laughs> if they're any good, I think. <laughs> uh, Tim, you know, when you think of the process and the outcome, what comes to mind? Sleep. <laughs> I can sleep now. No, I look. I I, I think the the what I think I'm most proud of is the fact that um, we we stayed true to our thesis. And at the end of the day, who would have ever thought that we would be able to have be fortunate enough to to attract a brand that is you know. You say top 100, I say top 20 in the world. Um, and to be able to have that leadership group come through this building and you know, have the district be so tangible to them and them being excited about it. Paul Grimwood, who's uh, Nestle USA CEO, is such an excitable man. And his, uh, his excitement for this building, for this area, for this region is infectious. And for us, there's no better proxy for our marketplace than him and Dawn and just this entire story. So we're, we're really fortunate, hopefully, for this multiplier effect and hopefully just keep the momentum going. Amen. My perspective is a little bit different. I mean, I would say aggressive is the number one word that comes to play when we look at this process, and it doesn't stop, right? Like, we are on an aggressive design schedule. We, you know, our executives are fair, they're excited, but they're also, like, no nonsense, get it done, and any partner that works with us knows that. Um, you know, so I think it's exciting, and I think it's going to be a great outcome, but it's very, you know, it's a very aggressive timeline. Well, thank you all very much, and with this, I will introduce I'll introduce our next I'll introduce our next moderator, Victor Hoskins. It's right there. Okay. That you got to turn the hot seat. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Victor Hoskins, Director of Economic Development for Arlington County, and really glad to be here. I am totally thrilled that Nestle decides to come into town, and I have a fantastic panel up here. Um, Mary Claire Burke, um, who many of you, Derek, who many of you know is the president of the Roslyn Bid. Um, we have Mark Linder. You may not be familiar with him. Um, he's a partner um, at uh, Deloitte, um, and Mark is is. Okay, he's been in this industry, like me, a long time, um, and I have to tell you, when I knew that he was working on this, actually, I, I, I didn't even know, they didn't tell me his name, and then I walked in the room and I saw him, I go, okay, I'm nervous now. <laughs> because he does have a reputation that precedes him. Um, and then we have um, Rob McClintock, who is uh, with the um, Virginia Economic De uh, Development Partnership, which is our great partner down in Richmond, and he is VP of Research. And so I'm going to begin with Mark. Um, and Mark, I'd um, like to know um, what was the, um, the selection um, when it was initiated, when the selection process was initiated, what were the criteria, the major criteria that Nestle uh, put forth to you that they said, we have to have this, can't do without this? Sure. I want to buttress something Don said, that Nestle has an active portfolio of initiatives to look at efficiency and effectiveness to make the company better, and, and it did go back a long way. It's 2013, I looked at my files, and uh, we've done a lot of different scenario building around headquarters relocating, back office relocating, different aspects of the company relocating. Um, and for the headquarters, um, labor, 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 not only local, but at, and again, I have to distinguish. You look at a metro area, 
we compared metro areas to figure out what metro area. And then within the metro area, Dawn and the real estate team really took over to find the building and then look at the labor force within there. But uh, at a metro level, labor, talent availability, um, we looked at business climate. We looked at access because getting to Vive, Nestle also has most of its operations in the East Coast, so it was getting closer to other operations, other businesses or other companies. There's Nestle Waters and Purina, et cetera, to getting closer to them. Um, being close to Washington, D.C. ended up being important relative to um, regulatory and legislative side, too. So, and cost. We modeled the uh, labor cost, real estate cost. Uh, those were our primary criteria. So, just a just a little bit more on the on, on the granular side. How many markets did you look at? I'm just just out of curiosity. Some people have asked me that. I sure. So, a long time ago, we modeled about 50 metro areas. Uh, we very quickly got it down to about about 10. Um, and these are large metro areas with uh, enough population. Air service was very important. Cost structure was very important, the town pool. Uh, that then got to five. And then uh, when we got back at it very seriously in the fall, uh, we were down to three. And, uh, and it was really those three and then two when it came to the negotiations. Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. So now I'm just going to ask you this just, for, just to, for clarification. So if you had one deciding factor that stood out, not millennials, but millennials. Right. But yeah. what, what stood out? I mean, what was the one deciding factor to really like make the difference? So there is never one deciding factor. Uh, see, this is what I, this is why Mark makes me nervous. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, at a metro, comparing metros to metros, we yeah. had these criteria. They weighted the criteria, and honestly, that's very important to get the executive team aligned on the criteria and a process, and then stick to it. So that in the middle of it, somebody's not throwing a curveball or somebody's voice doesn't get louder than another and there was one particular person that had a very very loud voice um, but we kept going back to the process and the criteria so they were weighted we kept factoring them and it really wasn't one thing now when you get to the metro within dc so the millennial because that was a very important factor once you got within the uh, washington dc metro excellent, excellent. So Rob, we're going to move to you. I just want to ask you. So let's talk about your role sure. and you know what kind of information that you ask for. You know from the site location consultant or the brokers uh, that, that they need that you provide and what kind of assistance you provide. It's kind of describing. Right. First of all, let me say how glad I am to be here today because I'm finding out all the work you guys were doing before we even knew there was a project. <laughs> <laughs> They've been working for two years before our life changed, and our life actually changed. I went back to our records. I got all this document on October 7th. That was the day that the RFP was issued by Deloitte. Uh, to us and other unnamed competitors, we never, I would say, we never officially were told throughout the entire process who the other competitor was. So we were, in that sense, from a business intelligence perspective and in a bit of a vacuum. So then really we had to make sure our data was correct and, and locked lock down and, and proper. And, and you did not know this was Nestle until... We did What's not. End, right? We did not. It was known as Project Emerald. I don't know if that's common knowledge, yes. which is my wife's favorite jewel, I will say that. <laughs> so um, we, we got this RFP from Project Emerald. Project Emerald on October 7th, the due date was one week later. And uh, that was pretty generous, so we thank you, Mark. <laughs> Seven days, wow. So, um, you know, we, we did have a, a common understanding that there had been sort of the real estate track that had been working. And, and most of the questions, they were very specific to us about the kinds of uh, training and recruitment assistance that the Commonwealth of Virginia might have, uh, the nature of existing uh, statutory incentives that we have on the books, as well as discretionary incentives. So there was a lot of discussion, not so much at this first level about amounts of incentives, but how the programs work, the different categories, the rules and regulations that govern that, and how, they, how it would play out. So we spent a, a great deal of time in our response explaining the minutiae so that they understood uh, how this would play out if we got into a shortlist situation 
Uh, at the same time, the RFP was structured that it was not just a state request, and this is quite common, but also a regional view. And we, we looked at Northern Virginia. So I don't even know if Arlington knows this, but we actually put this out to the entire community in Northern Virginia. So we had six localities. Some of them are in, in the room here today. I've already talked to a couple of them that uh, used this week, this generous week that they were given to fill out all these very nosy questions. And I will just say to a man and woman, every community was very responsive, very professional, and we hit the deadline in on October 14th. Uh, and then it went into um, wait mode for a little bit, but not long, not long. And, and he just described the work that the locals do. You know, we work in partnership with, with Virginia Economic uh, Development Partnership. But it just as importantly, we work very closely with the Department of Commerce, uh, the Commerce Secretary, and, and the governor. And I want Mark and Rob to answer this question. So, the governor. The governor of Virginia. You tell us how the governor of Virginia got involved. Everybody knows he's an incredible salesman. But Mark first, and then Rob. Sure. Uh, actually, we started out talking to Secretary Haymar, um, CFO, a couple of conversations. Um, we had a nice lunch here when we were touring the building. Uh, Secretary was here, as was Vince, the head of economic development. Um, then uh, the, uh, the governor called uh, the CEO, uh, Paul Grimwood, and they had a discussion. Um, so there were a number of discussions, there were a number of meetings, uh, a handful, I'm not talking about 10 or 20. Uh, and then we ended up having a dinner too. Uh, the governor and secretary and Vince were out for uh, a dinner with uh, Paul Grimm with the CEOs, C the CFO and uh, the head of HR at uh, Bourbon Grill in, in uh, Glendale. And uh, they got to know each other. Um, there was trust there. It was very engaging from talking to Steve. I wasn't there talking to CFO, but uh, they really bonded. They really got a sense of interest partnership and uh, entertaining. I mean, Paul Grimwood's very entertaining, the governor's very entertaining, so uh, <laughs> sure, they, they, had, sure. they had a great, they really bonded, they felt like uh, the commitment was here to partner and, and uh, felt very good about it. Yeah, he's, he's the greatest governor ever. I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of governors, I've never worked with anyone like him. He's, he's just an explosive, and he means it too, he is not playing, he he's really, he's really sincere. So Rob, tell us a little bit about. Yeah, I, you know, I, I concur with every bit of that. Um, I would say, uh, what my, my team, I'm, I'm the head of research, and uh, Vince Barnett is our business development guy that uh, Mark talked about. Uh, but every Monday morning, we go over and meet with Secretary Haymor, and we say, here are the projects we've got. We've got a weekly list. And when this came in as an RFP, we kind of went over it. And he said, well, who is it? Who is it? Well, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but it had pretty good parameters, 748 jobs, $37 million. And, and so uh, he immediately, after our meeting, he always goes to the cabinet meeting and, you know, he downloads the governor and next thing you know, there's, these calls are being scheduled. Uh, they are a tremendous tandem. Uh, they're detailed, oriented. Uh, we give them lots of briefing material to digest. And I will tell you, they read every bit of it. They absorb it. Um, and you're, you're really well represented. Two different styles of people, but uh, um, Secretary Haymore really, um, well, the governor really depends on Secretary Haymore and us to sort of tee him up. But once, once we unleash him, you know, we just step back. Our job is to get him there on time and brief him, and, and I think he, he takes it from there. And believe, I, I, I was telling somebody in the elevator, I'm on governor number eight in this job with the Economic Development Partnership. So I've seen them all, and he's right up there. But uh, very, very actively engaged, always asking how can they help. And there's a piece of this I would like to just share. Um, we got our proposal in after the initial RFP, and we were told that we had made the short list. It was like early November. Um, uh, we had a chance to come up and talk about our, our incentive offerings, and you know, we came up a little bit light. And uh, we told that to Secretary Haymore. Next thing I know, we're briefing the governor, and we had to, we had a situation in Virginia where if you get over a certain level, ten million dollars of discretionary incentives and, and tax credits, you actually need to then talk to the General Assembly, a small group of an oversight group. So the governor got that teed up and actually made sales pitch. 
um, you know, to sort of help warm up the room before I had to go up and make the pitch. Um, but that and that was in December. But uh, he he was very active behind the scenes in very detailed ways that most people wouldn't realize he has that time in his schedule. He, he really makes economic development uh, a priority. Before I ask Mary, uh, Mary Bird, um, Mary Claire, the first question I want from her to answer. There was a dinner um, after the um, after the, uh, the the yes after the after Nestle, Nestle said yes, and we knew they were coming. The celebration dinner in Georgetown. Unfortunately, I couldn't go. I was so disappointed. But apparently, um, at that dinner, um, the governor showed up. He happened to be in the same restaurant having dinner, and I, I just thought that was fabulous and also indicative of he just snips out the deal, doesn't he? <laughs> He just doesn't give up. I love it. Hey, Victor, if I may, the, the one person who should be here and she's out marketing today is Tracy yes. Tynan. She yes. was the project yes. manager. I yes. want folks here to know yes. that she was our internal quarterback, and then she reached out to the folks in research and administration, and, and uh, she just gets great kudos. She was the one that spotted the governor at that dinner and, wow. and, and made sure he came down. All right. So, Mary Claire, so the bid. How did the bid help convince Nestle, and what are the kinds of things that you did to help in this yeah. process? So we work along various parts of the process. On a typical deal, we will begin working with the brokers. Uh, we have actually a, a, a business liaison and a broker liaison who works with the brokers. And so we provide resources about the neighborhood, collateral. Um, we really try to listen and understand what is the company looking for and so we can tailor the information. We actually have a Salesforce database, and so we keep information about all the companies, the residents, the retail who are here. We can give you demographics, industry specifics. Um, we, we are the ground floor in the neighborhood. So we really make it our business to know people, to engage with people. And we think that that's really one of the selling points is having a very engaged community. And so typically we would get involved, like I say, on the broker end of it. Uh, that can, in some cases, that means I go out and I meet with the CEOs as they're touring. In other cases, I don't find out until the deal's already done. That's actually more often than not. Um, actually, in the Nestle case, I found out because a reporter called me and said, Mary Claire, I have three sources that are going to go with the fact that Nestle is touring. I need you, I need you to get me uh, uh, an interview. So I called Tim. I said, Tim, we have a problem. And so at that point, I signed the NDA. I was brought in and I said, look, you know, we can definitely help. And, and that's where I worked with your team and with Christina Wynn and the amazing AED team. And we really, it was go time at that point because, you know, the, um, Nestle was very important to them, as, as Don said and, and Lou and Tim said, to really um, make sure that the company was taking care of the workforce. And so, you know, I think somebody used the word intangibles. To me, I mean, I know the deals and the deal points are important, the incentives are important, the location, the real estate, all those factors, to your point, they're all important. But I would say, to me, you know, having run my business, having worked with other leaders, those other things are not just intangibles. Those are critically important for any business to be successful is their employees' well-being and happiness. And so um, that's really what the AED team did was assemble a group of, of community partners, the bid, the chamber, and others to pull together resource fairs and presentations and information and all the things that would be needed once the announcement was made to the employees. And so it, it really depends on what the deal is as to how the bid gets involved. Um, you know, and then if and, and even on those deals where we find out through the through the local paper, um, you know, we come in at the back end of that, and then that's when our work really begins. I actually really related, Don, to your last comment around you know the aggressiveness of the timeline. I mean, you know, AED and the state and and Deloitte and all of that front end work that happens was just impressive and incredible. I mean, the time frame was crazy. Um, but really, the work begins once the employees land here. Because in my mind, that's when retention begins. That's when we need to make sure that it is a soft landing as, as best it can be, that they feel welcomed as part of the community, get them involved, get them active. Um, and that's what we excel at. And that's what we, we love doing with our companies. Fantastic. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but I'd like Mark to talk a little bit about um, really the concept of the really the, the support system after what you just mentioned the familiarity tours the resource room all the things that you actually suggested maybe something that we might want to try to do which of course we did <laughs> sure. well a quick comment about the bid um, 
it became important once we were down to the final two buildings and we were looking at this building. Um, and as great as this building is, there were some concerns. Um, Nestle is in a suburban environment in uh, the Los Angeles area. You had a suburban option and then you had an urban option. And to get them comfortable with the immediate neighborhood, the downtown, uh, the amenities. I mean, you look across the street and there's a future maybe. You kept telling us some restaurants are going to come in here. and <laughs> they're, uh, coming. <laughs> they're coming, they're coming. But to help get us comfortable with that vision, right, as well as safety issues, the bus, just a whole bunch of issues. So you were an integral player early on to get, get us that information, that comfort level. Um, partly to the whole concept of a cross-country move, um, knowing that um, we would not be able to retain everyone. Uh, that just simply wouldn't make the move. The minute we started looking outside of California, and it's hard to get Californians to move outside of California, um, we put a lot of work together to induce people to help them get more familiar. Um, a very comprehensive program that we're helping with around a re retention and relocation, created these familiarization or look-see tours, massive effort on Nestle's part, but we partnered with the county and the bid and the community um, to tour people. Um, they've got a reload company that they work with here too, but a very comprehensive, massive program to get people comfortable to come. And, Private uh, label website. <laughs> and, 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 the, and really the county and the locals really delivered. Um, literally on the spot, some things we ask of them, created from scratch, yeah. collected two data, etc. Two, two weeks for a website that is completely interactive, shows you commuting ranges so employees could actually figure out where they wanted to live, you know, these presentations schools. and tour. I mean, the schools yeah. Yeah. brought in all the resources, um, and that's, you know, it, it, it really was an impressive. One of our employees worked day and night, and he's here right now standing behind that camera, Brent. He worked day and night for two weeks, and we had to give him a week off. <laughs> Just to, just to rest. I mean, seriously. But that's how committed we were because we because we knew what a what a. Someone said it yesterday. You know, this is a this is a this is a change maker. This is this is changing our future. And I think that's what Tim and his team knew. I think that's what Lou knew. He knew it was going to change our future. And I think that's really what we all kind of realized as we went through it. I have to I have to hand it to Tim and his team for hanging in there all of this time for the perfect tenant. Not for a good tenant, not for the right tenant, for the perfect tenant. And I think that it really bodes well for the future of Arlington County and economic development. And I want to thank everyone in here for, for coming and hearing um, our little talk about the, the deal itself. And I don't know if we're going to, Gary, I think, is going to take over at this point. We got a few questions. We do have a couple questions. Uh, I think they're probably here towards either Dawn or Mark. Are there any plans to involve? Uh, local small businesses in the uh, in the entire process, uh, whether it's contractors or services or, or whatever the case may be. I actually, I actually could answer that. Last night, okay, last night I was at I was at Eastern Foundry. I'm just, you know, I'm in Eastern Foundry. We were having a, the Arlington uh, premiere, which is when we bring all the new businesses together. A couple of hundred people in the room. I don't know how this woman found me. She runs up to me and says, hey, I have a tasting at Nestle next week. I go, what? I'm a caterer, and I, they're going to be tasting my food. I mean, it, they are, are, it's already happening. I mean, it is happening right now. Nestle knows what to do. Um, and these businesses that are... Um, really proactive and leaning forward are involved. So um, if, if you're not, you may want to go to their website, um, you may want to call our office, but the bottom line, it's already happening. Right. Yeah. And then this one is probably the most important, and I guess it's probably the dog. Where can we get chocolate sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, and this really was written down, uh, and I didn't write it, I swear. Uh, with that, thank you very much for everyone for coming. Please join us uh, back, right back at the bar. We have uh, beer tasting, I don't know what that is, but uh, by Port City and Right Proper Brewery, sponsored by York Allen and JLL. Thank you.